Thanks for watching MMA Oddsbreaker, ladies and gentlemen. Frank Trigg, and yes, that is the most famous Portuguese translator on the planet, Ed Suarez. <laughs> people forget Thanks. you're actually a manager. They just think you're a translator now. Uh, people, well, now, I, I hardly translate anymore. I know. Like everyone's in, Is it one of the requirements now that uh, everyone's got to speak English? No, it's not that. It's just um, I, I just choose not to translate anymore. I'm kind of over it. You know, I mean, and Der Derek which works with us, uh, you know, is, is, is taking up that, uh, sort of, uh, you know, like, I mean, I'll still do it if I have to, but it's, you know, I just did it more or less to, to help, you know, to just do the best job that I could, but, you know, it's just, you know, we've got other people to do that now. And, and hopefully most of our guys are speaking more English now so they can speak English on their own. Well, you know, I forget that I talked to a lot of these guys separately with no cameras around, no microphones and their English is much better than when you're trying to talk to them 20 seconds after they finish punching someone in the face. Of so course. At that point, yeah, you kind of need a translator because your mind's in 20 different directions. So I forget that for a while, Leoto needed a translator. He really speaks, he speaks really good English, but it's just tough. When yeah. You... He... Go ahead, Ed. At times, it's, it's, they can, I said, no, most of the time he can, um, he can speak it okay. It's, it's just sometimes in, in the heat of the moment, he sometimes has trouble understanding the question. So more or less now with Lyoto, um, we're there more or less to, to make sure he understands the question. And he feels pretty good with his English now that he's living here in the States. Yeah. He feels comfortable enough with his English that he can answer it on his own. Well, before we get into Anderson Silva and Chris Weidman, which is the hot topic that I'm sure you're tired of answering anything about right now, I want to talk to you a little about RFA. Uh, it seems like you guys are crushing it as a minor league with RFA because all your best guys are getting picked up and moving over to UFC. Hey, that's, that's the goal of what we're trying to do. You know, I mean, my goal when, when, when I came on board to the uh, RFA was to, uh, to put together and to create a development or a developmental organization for the UFC. And, um, and that's what's happening. And, and I'm super excited about it. It's probably one of the things in my life right now that I'm more, most excited about right now is, is I really but I, I, that's what I was before I started my clothing company. I was a big promoter, and I used to do events and concerts and and nightclubs. So, so I mean, I, I love it, and and I've been able to take the experience that I've had uh, from being a manager and and. hopefully apply and, and do what I've got to do as a promoter. I, I really enjoy it. I'm, I'm, I'm having a great time with it. And we're, we're every day that goes by, um, I feel that our folks are stronger. I mean, there's so many deals and some other things that are really exciting. You take a look at like a guy like James Krause takes a short notice fight against Sam Stout, comes in and beats Sam Stout, takes him out, gets a uh, fight of the night uh, off that fight. Do you think that in the negotiation process it was a lot easier because he was coming from RFA than, than, say, a different organization? Because, one, obviously the UFC brass know who you are. They know how you deal. They know how, who the promotion is. And then even, even though James is a different management team, do you think that helped him coming over because he had been fighting for your promotion too? Well, I, I think I think that could. I, I think uh, I, I think definitely it it, help, it doesn't hurt you. That's for sure. But I, I think that the truth is that his last five fights were in the RFA, and um, he's basically he, his last fight in the RFA. He was the main event. So at, at any point in time where you're able to be a main event on a nationally televised card, I mean that that definitely gives some sort of security to the to the USC to know that he's going you're going to be able to perform on the big stage. And and you know one of the things that we're trying to do with, with the RFA is not only is it a different field, which you know very well, Frank, uh, from fighting in smaller events, going up through the WFA and then fighting in the uh, UFC and, and, and fighting in all different sizes and different types of organizations, you realize that it's, it, yeah, it's one thing to go in there and fight um, with the lights, cameras and all that. That's a different element. But also I feel that outside the, the ring or the octagon is when you really see the difference. And one of the things we're trying to develop the guys is to kind of get them trained and develop them for what they can expect from the 
responsibilities and our ego commitments, um, you know, responsibilities, and all these types of things that people kind of don't realize that that's what we're trying to do. So if you're a feature fight, a co-main event, or a main event on the RFA, you're going to get, you know, uh, the similar sort of treatment. You're going to have media commitment. You're going to have to do media. You're going to have to do the ENGs. You're going to have to do all these things, which uh, hopefully are going to get you better prepared to move up to the next level. Well, at least in James Krause's position, it helped out obviously tremendously because he took it with a grain of salt. He had no problems at all, was ready to go, and, and made, not only made himself look good and his training camp look good out of Kansas City, but also made RFA look good because every time anybody talked to him, he was like, yeah, you know, got a short notice fight. I just fought in RFA, was getting ready to go, and now I'm, I'm in the UFC in the big show and deserves to be there, and he's proven it. So for yeah. you guys, it looked great. It looked amazing. Yeah. It, it, you know what? And it, the cool thing is, is being a manager, you know, um, you know, that there's a, the way when, when James got the phone call up to go up to go fight in the UFC, to me, it, it, it was almost the same feeling that I got when one of the guys I managed get him getting him into the UFC. I mean, I was anxious to see how he was going to do. And I believe me, I mean, and you could ask James, this is not just me saying that. I mean, the minute I found out he got in the UFC, you could ask him. I texted him. I called him. I spoke with him. I told him how proud I was of him and that he deserved to be there. And I, I, I mean, I sincerely was that. And then when I saw what he did in there, I mean, it couldn't have made me prouder. You know, he, he's a good guy. He's a good man. And he, and he's a great fighter. And he, I'm really happy to see that he got that opportunity and, and, and he grabbed it and, and ran with it. Let's move on from the RFA main event and go on to the UFC's next main event, July 6th. Here in Las Vegas, Nevada, Chris Weidman versus the champion, Anderson Silva. The rumors have been abounding left to right. Anderson was going to pull out. You know, we had uh, uh, Adam Hill at the Las Vegas Review Journal here in Vegas was absolutely positive Anderson was going to pull out of the fight and not take the fight. Uh, he has stated that uh, Anderson didn't want this fight, said that he wanted to take anybody else but Chris Weidman. And at some point, he's going to pull out. He finally changed his tune two weeks ago and said, yeah, no, for sure Anderson's showing up now. He's definitely not going to pull out. It's too close to the fight, and it's not, not his kind of style. As a manager, how do you try to keep your fighter buffered from that kind of noise that goes on, from media guys just putting on that, that extra little bit of horseradish and, and salt on all the game when it really doesn't need to be there, but we're doing it anyway to kind of create stories? Uh, you know what? Uh, Anderson's an experienced fighter enough that I, there's nothing really I can do. You know what I mean? Anderson is is just he's a superstar now. So it, it, as much as I'm his manager, uh, the the you know we're we're now at this point in his life we're mainly focused on him and just his fight stuff. And and I think he's he's so such in the media right now and he's all the time he's in the media. There's so many things he, that uh, you know I think he's uh, experienced enough and not knowledgeable enough in this business that he doesn't pay much attention to that kind of stuff. You know, people are going to say what they want to say. Um, you know, what Chris Weidman is saying, many people have said before, and, and like I've said before, it's great that he says that stuff. Chris Weidman's confident. He says that he's not going to go in there and be scared of him. You shouldn't be scared of him. You're fighting for the middleweight, you know, the UFC middleweight championship of the world. So you shouldn't be scared. And, and you have to have that sort of attitude. But at the end of the day, when they close the octagon door and you're standing across from Anderson Silva, all those things that you said that you were going to do, let's see you do them. It just doesn't seem to work out that way. You know what I mean? What, what does Chris Ryman do differently than anybody else he's faced? You tell me what you think he does differently. He's a good wrestler. He's big. He's strong. He, he's got some stand-up. He's good on the ground. I think, from my standpoint, he's the, he's the most complete fighter that Anderson has faced to this point. He faced a great wrestler in Chael Sonnen, but really doesn't have that much stand-up. He really couldn't threaten from the, from the guard. Once he was in guard, he really couldn't threaten uh, Anderson at all. Chael style is a pepper shot you. He faced a really good striker, explosive striker in Vitor Belfort. Faced a really, really good wrestler, but really doesn't use his wrestling well. And Dan Henderson uh, does, you know, obviously Stefan Bonner was a, was a gimme. The second fight with Chael Sonnen was, was, a, was a gimme. He, he battled against a really, really good jiu-jitsu guy in Damian Maya, but that was kind of a snore fest because Damian really didn't want to engage and, and Anderson wanted to engage on his feet. But both guys had to play their game. With Chris Weidman, he's a great wrestler. He's, great, he's better than average on, on his feet, and he's got incredible ground and power. So I think it's the more complete guy that, he's, that Anderson's really faced. And even though Anderson's legacy is still established, no matter what happens in this fight, he's still going to go down as one of the, if not the greatest fighter of all time. He'll be, always be 
in that name set of the top 10 guys of all time of being one of the best fighters. I right. think Weidman's the only guy we faced in a long time that Anderson's faced that actually is a complete package after everyone knows how good Anderson is and how much he can actually bring to the table. Does this worry and, and, and make Anderson push harder knowing that he's got a guy that's, that's better than everybody else in all aspects of the game? Um, I, I put it this way. Regardless of who the opponent is, Anderson always trains very hard, and he's always very focused and, and, and determined. So I'm not worried about that. Um, like I said, yeah, he's a very experienced fighter, but, you know, um, a fight to fight, Frank. You know that better than anybody. You know, anything can happen. He, Anderson moves left instead of moving right. You know, his night could end. And the same thing for Chris. And, and the thing is, is Chris, yeah, he's this, he's that, but – He's never faced, put it this way, Chris has never in his life faced someone like Anderson Silva either. People are putting that in his face going, oh, well, you know, you've never faced someone like uh, like Chris Weidman. But let me tell you, who has Chris Weidman faced that, yeah. that's been close to Anderson Silva? So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I guess we'll see. That that That's why everyone should buy the pay-per-view and see what's going to happen. At 33, at 33 and 4, obviously experience goes to Anderson because Weidman's only 9 and 0. Oh. But it, it is one of those fights now that if you're in the UFC and you're that, you're that good, the experience level doesn't make a difference. But you're correct that if you look at the record base of who these guys have fought and take the top three guys from each guy's record and just use those three alone, Anderson still has fought tougher guys uh, from Okami and Henderson and, and Vitor Belfort than, than uh, uh, Chris Weidman has as a whole. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, Frank, anything can happen. You know, uh, Chris Weidman is not sitting I had before this fight even started. You know, Anderson's got uh, ten title defenses in the UFC. He should be eleven if 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 uh, Travis if Luter, Travis Luter would, would have made weight. So he's got you know, so he's got more title defenses than than Chris Weidman has fights. So had Chris Weidman fought before? Yeah, had Chris Weidman been a main event? Yeah, he was a main event of a FX or a, of a fuel card last summer. That was the only time he had any sort of uh, media. So this time being a main event on a pay-per-view and there's a lot of things that uh, go into that and uh, you, you have that you, you know, the pressure you know all that and and you know we'll see what we'll see what happens you know I know how Anderson handles it he's handled it many times before you know he's fought that uh, you know, so it's like you know uh, I don't know. I, I, I like I said. I, I believe uh, Chris Weidman is a tough guy, but uh, I believe in Anderson Silva. I believe he's the greatest fighter of all time, and I believe he's going to come out victorious on Saturday night. Our right, last question before we let you go. There's been a lot of controversy, a lot of talk about fighter pay. Dana White has come out and said uh, uh, whether or not he holds true to it, he's going to cut um, the fight the fight bonuses, and he's going to give money to the lower end of the guys so they make more money. From your standpoint, from manager's standpoint, would you rather see the bottom guys get more money as a whole, or would you rather see the fight of the night bonuses, the submission of the night, knockout of the night bonuses stick uh, be, stick around? Which one would you rather have? More money for the lower end or, for, or uh, fight bonuses? I don't think it's a problem. I'm saying I like to see everything. I mean, that's, that's a hard um, – I'd like to see the fighters pay uh, move up, but uh, – you know, I, I'm one to, to tell you that, you know, uh, the, the, the fighter bonuses, the fight of the night bonuses, that, that's, that's very inspiring. You know, you look at a guy like James Krause that comes in making eight and eight, goes out there and puts on a fight of the night and a submission of guys. So I think that's definitely a stimulant and a motivator for people to go out there and put, put everything on the line. Um, you know, as far as like, yeah, should the, the lower end guys make more money? Uh, of course they should. Um, and, you know, unfortunately now with the sponsorship situation in the UFC, there's not as much money in sponsorships as there was, once was. There's not as many, much money available. People, you know, never been. unfortunately, the, the, the sponsorship is less and less. More and less. It's not that there's as much. It's not like there's that much less. It's just that there's not as many places we can go to get the money. And and on top of that, 
you know, where five years ago they were doing 20 events a year. Now they're doing 40 events a year. So just because they doubled the amount of events doesn't mean that all these people that are spending money marketing in MMA are doubling their marketing budget. So it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a real, uh, you know, that's a hard question to say, you know what I mean? But for me, um, yeah, I'd like to see the, the guy's purse go up a little bit more, but I, I also like to see the guys that go out there and leave it all on, you know, leave it all on the octagon, get that bonus. So, I mean, if, if, if for me, my opinion, I have to say, if I choose one or the other, I choose for the bonuses because I, I think, I think that the guys should be rewarded uh, for doing that. Um, and I, and I think, um, just naturally the, the fighters purses are going to be going up because it, it has, I mean, I remember when the UFC first started their, you know, their basic pay was three and three, four and four, yep. two and two. <laughs> and, you know, now they're making eight and eight with the opportunity to make an extra hundred grand. Yeah. So, so, and, and you know what, on top of that, the people uh, forget is, is that uh, the discretionary bonuses, you know, um, 90% of the time, uh, you know, three, three months after, you know, these guys get checks in the mail and people say, oh, it's only your favorite one. No, it's not, no. man. Those guys are very good about that. And, and, and they send out those discretionary bonuses. And, and that's exactly what they are. They're discretionary bonuses. And, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I give you a great example is a guy like Kevin Casey, who's a guy that we represent. He went out there, you know, he did a great job on the show. He went out there and fought on the finale. Um, and, and basically lost on the finale, got cut, but yet three weeks after, got a nice check in the mail. Uh, for, you know, the guy's not even with the UFC anymore, and they still send him a discretionary bonus. So, you know, I, I think that people tend to forget about those things. And, and overall, um, would I like to see fighters' purse go up? Of course I would. It would be, it would be great. But, but people also this is and um, and the, the 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 progression that we've made in the past ten years um, is is incredible. To, to you know, and we go back and look at other professional sports. And yeah, this sport started in 1993, but but really it started from 2001 on. That's the way I really look at it. You know, that that's when the, this this sport started getting sanctioned by the athletic commission, and this thing really became a sport. And to think from 2001 to 2013. In 12 years, the progression that it's made to be to to be uh, to be um, uh, you know to have an athletic commission and to be sanctioned in 49 of the 50 states, and and, and we look back at other professional sports like football. I can remember in the late 70s and early 80s, you know, NFL football players were selling cars and selling insurance on the off season to supplement their income, and that's only you know 20, 30 years ago. And how many years was the NFL around then? Yeah, you know since I mean? the 20s. So, yeah, so. so 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 when you when you think about that, you have to look at in boxing. You know, it's like oh yeah, you know, uh, Floyd Mayweather made thirty thirty two million dollars. Well, you know what? In the late sixties, uh, Muhammad Ali was making a million bucks. And what's a million bucks? Two million bucks in nineteen sixty nine. That that's a lot of money if you if, if you put it. so so I think people have to understand that our sport's still a young sport and there's still a lot of a lot of things that are happening in it. So you know, to me, you know, uh, we got back onto this question and I like I like the bonuses one. Keep yeah. the bonuses. I'm a big my, my thing is I think there's if there's ten fights on the card half the, half the fights get bonuses and half don't. Three are going to be the, are going to be a seventy five thousand dollar you know submission of the night for the night. Uh, yeah. uh, knock out of the night, and then two other discretionary bonuses, whatever they want to call it. It's like yeah. fifty thousand. Then all of a sudden, you got a real game because then you're going, "Wow, I'm one of ten, and only five of us are going to get bonuses, and five of us aren't going to get bonuses." So now all of a sudden, everyone's going to have to start ramping up the game. Even if it's a fifty thousand dollar bonus, you'll take that versus being one of the five that doesn't get anything. So you know, yeah. now you start looking at it like, "Oh, geez, like I got to fight because I got to go out there and get a submission. I got to get a knockout. I got to go nuts all three rounds." Just a yeah. point because I I can't be that guy on the card that doesn't get one because everyone's gonna start talking about my fights gonna be the lower end fights that fight right. I didn't get one I'm one of the bad fights of the five it's just you know yeah, give, the only problem out, is, is that, the, the, the only problem is is it's never gonna be that because you have to think that there's at least ten or eleven fights on all the cards so you're yeah. looking at one of twenty guys twenty to twenty two well, guys yeah well yeah. no but you get you know you get that you get that half like your your fight even if you didn't get it. And that you got submitted, 
but your guy got the submission tonight. Your fight at least got a bonus. Like your fight did not necessarily. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your fight did. The other five got nothing. They were so bad, they got nothing. Now it's like, wow, I don't want to be in that fight. You know, it's almost to the point. Like I'm gonna go out and give everything I got just to prove, just so I can get beat. My fight have one of the bonuses coming in. So it's gonna, you know, but who knows? You know, Dan and Florenz are gonna do what they're gonna do, and we're gonna follow suit, and we're all gonna say yes. And it's like I've always said, you don't get what you're worth. I was worth a million dollars every time I fought. Never got a million dollars. I got what I negotiated. And that's what I signed on the dotted line. And I got discretionary checks that on the night, and when I, if I had won, my discretionary check that I got was more than I if I had won that night. So they always right. took care of me. And they didn't like me. So can you imagine if, you know, if it's discretionary, if you'd like somebody, give them a little bit more. But they took care of me and they didn't like me. So they're taking care of guys for sure all the way across the board. And I would love to see the money get better at the bottom end, but I, I'm with you. I would rather see the fight bonuses. I think guys are going to fight harder and yeah. work harder with a fight bonus. I, I agree, man. And people always talk about this. And, and, you know, go look at some pro boxing cards and see what happens. I mean, there's guys that fight on the uh, on the uh, Mayweather card that are making a thousand bucks. Yeah. You know yeah, what I'm make, saying? So, making so, 500 bucks so a round, fighting make four it, yeah, yeah, If that. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen 100 bucks a round. Yeah. You know, to, to 200 bucks a round, 300 bucks a round. You fight a, a six round fight, you make, you know, a thousand bucks, 1200 bucks. And God forbid you knock them out in the third round because you only get, you only get paid a hundred bucks a round. You're only making $300. Well, yeah, but I knocked them out. Too bad. You're supposed, you only get paid a hundred bucks a round. Good luck. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh. yeah. Boxing. Everyone talks about how good boxing is, but it's basically three guys, four guys are getting paid. Everybody well, I don't else know. I don't know if it works like that. I think, I think you get paid. I think you get paid like the, the purse. So it's like it's so like the way they figure it is. It's like it's a four round fight. So you and get if paid it's a four, four. You get you get paid for four rounds. If you knock them out in twenty seconds, hey man, you you got paid higher per. Yeah, you still get your you still get your grand. You know, you yeah. still get whatever they guaranteed you. They just base it off of you taking the full length of the fight. Got gotcha. you. So I it's mean, the same as. Same as MMA, you get a finish, yes. you get a finish, you yeah. get paid. Yeah, yeah, you still get paid, but you know, at the end of the day, it's just these guys aren't making that much money. No, thousand dollars, fifteen hundred bucks. And, and when you look at boxing compared to mixed martial arts, you know, you've got two percent, one or two percent of the boxers are making ninety-five percent of the money, and in MMA, at least, you're getting about thirty percent of the fighters probably making about sixty-five to seventy percent of the money. So yeah. it's it's still one-sided, but that's what it's like in every sport, man. You know what I mean? You you got LeBron James, and you got the guys that are granted. You know, the guys in the NBA are making a you know a, a good base salary if you're in the NBA, but. You know, but also how long has the NBA been around? Look how long it's on national television. I mean, there's there's a lot of things. So, you know, I, I think the sport is doing good for where it's at. Would I like to see more? I think all of us would like to see more. Uh, the, more the more, the merrier. And everybody always wants to make more money. I know I do. Yeah, no kidding, right? That's why I love you, Ed. <laughs> you, yeah. You've never given it up from the day when you just run in uh, sinister clothing. It's the same kind of mentality. Always, always find a way to make a little bit more money, no matter how you have to do it, and do it honestly, and you'll be fine. That's yeah. it, man. As long as you're doing it honestly, that's what's important, man. I mean, other than that, I mean, you got to work hard. No, nothing comes easy. People always tend to see the results, but they never see everything that it takes to get those sort of results. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for watching MMA Odds Breaker. That's Ed Suarez. I'm Frank Trigg. Ed, good luck this weekend. I know you'll be on Pins Thank and Needles until the fight's over. We'll talk uh, to you later. All right. Take care.